Hello, and welcome to today's seminar. I am Beth Mischewski, Senior Scientific Specialist at the Illinois Sustainable Technology Center and seminar co-organizer. I just have a couple of housekeeping items before we get started. I would like to remind our audience members here to please silence electronic devices as we are recording today's seminar. We will hold all questions until the end, at which time I will bring around the microphone so that those online can hear your questions. For those online, you can type in your questions at any time and, I'll answer the, and we'll answer those at the end as well. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome today's speaker, Krista Wigginton. Krista is an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Michigan. She earned her bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Idaho and her master's and PhD in environmental engineering from Virginia Tech. Her research interests include mechanistic fate of viruses in treatment processes and improving uh, virus detection in water. Krista will also be serving as a panelist at ISTC's upcoming Emerging Contaminants Conference in May. The agenda and registration will be available soon. Please join me in welcoming Krista. Great, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I, I'll assume that you can all hear me okay and let me know if that's not the case. <laughs> yep, we can hear you. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so yeah, today I'm gonna talk about the research that I've done at the University of Michigan, and a little bit from before, on viruses in the environment, um, both on how um, they're detected and advancements in detecting them, and we do quite a bit um, on the fate of them in the environment, so I'll talk about both. Let's see here. Okay, so I sh should acknowledge the students and researchers that helped me with the data that I'm gonna show today. Um, Sage Chang was a master's student with me and then stayed around to be a research scientist for a couple of years after her master's. Yin Yin Yi and Zhang Chao both finished their PhD just within the last um, couple of months and have moved on, but, so, but some of the work that I'll show here was part of their PhD projects. Um, and then of course the funding projects, um, the funding for the projects I'll discuss come from the National Science Foundation. So an outline of what I'll talk about today. I'll, I'll talk, I'll, I'll introduce you to, um, to viruses and their structure I, I, and the characteristics that might impact both how they, how they travel around in the environment and how they're inactivated in the environment and then through maybe through treatment processes and also talk about um, the detection of them. So the status of how, how we monitor for them and advancements in that. Or sorry, I'll, I'll start, start with the characteristics that we use to talk about them and the detection methods. And then I'll talk about some of the research. Um, in particular, I'm gonna talk about the enveloped viruses in the environment. Most of the research historically has focused on non-enveloped viruses in the environment. So today we'll talk, I'll talk about our mechanistic understanding of what the envelopes do to impact their fate. And then last, I'll describe a recent method that we developed called integrated cell culture mass spectrometry that we think offers some um, advantages in certain situations for monitoring viruses. All right, so some, some overview for those of you that might not be so familiar with, with viruses. They are the major cause of both gastro, gastrointestinal and respiratory diseases. Um, on the left, and these are, of course, the diseases that get detected and, and, and um, identified. But so if we, this was a study done on GI illnesses, and if we broke down into the different, um, different agents that cause those illnesses, we find that norovirus in particular causes quite a few of the GI illnesses, rotavirus, rotavirus quite a bit, but overall the viruses make up more than 50% of reported um, GI illnesses, and even a higher percent of respiratory illnesses. So over on the right, a study showing that 79% um, of the illnesses were due to viral. So they have a large you know, pathogenic burden on humans, and so of course that makes them important in, in public health. So when, when, when we think about what makes viruses special and what their, what their specific characteristics are, one of the things we look at is the size, their size that makes them unique, they're very small. So those noroviruses that I mentioned were so important with GI illnesses. Their diameters are only around 20 to 40 nanometers. Adenoviruses are a little bit larger, but in general, um, most of the viruses in the environment are around 100 nanometers or less. 
And if we think about that in terms of, you know, comparison to a common bacteria that we work with quite a bit, E. coli, we're orders of magnitude smaller in size. And this is important for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's, that makes them much harder to detect. If we want to concentrate them out of water, we have to use filters that are much smaller with much smaller pores. Um, that makes them too small to really see with most mic microscopic methods. We have to use electron microscopy to, to visualize virus particles. And it also makes virus counting, part, counting um, particle techniques difficult. So they're challenging with flow with methods like flow cytometry, or we call flow virometry, um, because they don't contain as much genetic material and they just don't cause as large of a signal. So detecting them um, can, be, can be difficult because of size. What, something else that makes viruses unique compared to other microbes is that they can have different types of genomes. So they can have single-strand RNA genomes, double-strand RNA, single-strand DNA, and double-strand DNA. And we classify viruses to a great extent based on the type of genome that they have. And this is important for detection and fate because the different genome types have different reactivities. So when we think about disinfection with UV, these different genome types will react differently with UV. And so we can't make kind of sweeping conclusions about all virus genomes um, because of these differences. Uh, it makes detection complicated because if we're going to use a method like um, qPCR, we can't go directly to qPCR for all viruses. We have to reverse transcribe the RNA viruses for detection. And it complicates sequencing efforts because they don't have, unlike other organisms, they don't have conserved regions across all viruses. And so we can't amplify a specific sequence in and get all viruses and then, uh, you know, make, make sure that we have, that we've amplified just the viruses. And so um, in order to do, do sequencing, we have to do shotgun metagenomics where we really sequence everything if we want to identify all the viruses that are there. All right, so something else that we look at is beyond, so they have these genomes that can be, you know, different types of genomes, and then those genomes are encapsulated in this protein coat. Um, and these protein coats are often repeated proteins that create this capsid structure. So maybe a virus will have five or six different types of proteins, but those proteins will be repeated over and over throughout the capsid. Um, and of course, these proteins are made up of amino acids, and these amino acids have different chemistries, and that impacts, you know, the 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 things like the charge of the particle or the hydrophobicity of the particle, um, both important for detection and for environmental fate. Uh, and so we often think about how these characteristics might differ from virus to virus. Okay, so we've talked about the genome and then these proteins that encapsulate the genome. In addition to that, some viruses have an envelope on the outside of their protein, and some even have envelopes on the inside of their protein. But they, this, this lipid bilayer can be incorporated into the entire virus um, particle. Um, so we, we differentiate these as non-enveloped viruses, like what I'm showing on the right or on, on the left with just the genome and the protein, versus these envelope viruses on the right, which have this outer layer of an envelope layer. This, this envelope um, is picked up by its host cell, so viruses infect a host, and then when they're released from the host or released um, from an organelle in the host, they'll pick up the, the lipid bilayer from the host. And so um, these, these are very host dependent and they can, they can have proteins in them, embedded in them that are important for um, cell recognition and getting the genome inside of the new host cell when it infects a new host cell. This is important because the envelope definitely impacts how we might detect the viruses, pull it out of the water, and how it's going to um, behave in the environment, um, how susceptible it is to oxidants when we disinfect and to surfactants and things like that. So um, this is another characteristic that's important. And then the last characteristic I'll mention is um, tropism. This is uh, the, the complement, you know, the, the complement cell to a virus. So a, a virus has a particular cell or a particular group of cells that it can infect. And that's through how it, identif it identifies these cells based on the proteins that are out on its outer layer. And the idea is that a, if the virus is, if the cell is complementary to the virus, then the virus will um, either the whole virus will go inside of the cell or maybe just the genome will be inserted into the cell. And then once it's in the cell, it uses the cell's um, machinery to make new copies of its genome and to make new copies 
of um, the proteins. And then, of course, it takes, if it's enveloped, it takes the lipid of the cell with it. So it makes many, many copies within the host. And then at some point, um, if, the, if it's lytic, the cell will, will lyse and release all of these viruses. And then what happens are the viruses often will go to the nearest cells um, to the one that it, just, that it was just released from and infect those cells. So over time, um, over time, you can see many cells um, um, be lysed, and we, we harness this in um, detection methods. So what we do is we'll add a sample to our, you know, we'll add a sample to a host cell system, and then if it has an infective virus present, it'll infect those cells, lice and lice more cells, and over time what we'll see are these holes form in a 2D cell system. Um, and so this is this is how we culture viruses in, in the lab. So you can imagine if we don't have the right cell system, if we're not growing the right cell system in the lab for the virus that's in the sample, we won't see an effect in these cells and then we won't detect the viruses. And so what this what this ends up looking like with virus culture methods um, is this is a, this is a cell line here that's been dyed pink, and where each of these each of these holes in this in this lawn of cells is called a plaque. And what it is is a, a single virus or maybe a clump of viruses have infected a cell, and then those cells have lysed and gone to the next cells and the next cells. And over time, we get a hole in this um, 2D this two-day layer of cells, and we call that a plaque. And so we can enumerate how many infective viruses were in our sample based on the number of these plaques that form in our, in our 2D cell, um, cell line. But you can imagine that we have to have the right cells to detect the virus that's there. And a lot of the viruses that we care about for public health and also, you know, when we're studying viruses in ecosystems, we might not be able to culture in the lab. For instance, I'll go, we think back to that norovirus. Norovirus doesn't have a, a culture system, a cell culture system right now that it can readily infect in, in the lab. Of course, in our, in our bodies, it's really good at infecting our cells, but we can't grow the cells um, that it infects in our bodies very well in the lab. And so we therefore can't culture norovirus. Um, and this is a problem for lots of different viruses. We're really limited in the viruses that we can detect with traditional culture methods. And so when we don't have culture methods that are available, when we don't have those complementary cells, we use molecular methods instead. So we use PCR. And so just um, talk, talking through how PCR works, for those of you who maybe have heard of it but haven't used it before, and for those of you that have, this is review. Um, so I mentioned before viral genomes can be RNA or DNA. So I'll first say, show how we would detect a viral, say a norov norovirus is a single-strand RNA virus. And so what we would do is we'd go to a sample, we'd extract all of the nucleic acids from that sample. There are kits that will just detect, will, will, um, will uh, enrich for viral nucleic acids. And so maybe we've tried to just pull out the viral nucleic acids. And so we have these nucleic acids and we've, we've got to design a primer that will go after the norovirus genome. So it's been designed to find a sequence in the RNA and it's a complementary strand to a sequence of the, in the RNA that's specific for norovirus. And then we'll use a reverse transcriptase um, enzyme to make a complementary strand of that um, norovirus RNA that might be in our sample. And then with that complementary, um, this is cDNA, so with this complementary cDNA strand, we'll, we'll have another primer that detects this complementary um, norovirus sequence. And then with the polymerase, we'll do several um, or many cycles of uh, the uh, polymerase reaction, which amplifies that little sequence that we've that we've created from the norovirus genome. And then through um, we we often will use dyes that recognize that we're making more and more copies of this sequence, and over time we'll be able to detect a signal. And we re we relate the intensity of this signal that forms from all of these strands that are forming back to the original concentration of this norovirus gene that we had in our sample. So this is how RTQPCR works for RNA viruses, but we could do the same thing with DNA and just skip that RT step where we have, we're looking for say a, a DNA virus um, genome or gene. We've got a primer that we've designed that's specific for that um, virus gene. And then we use polymerase to make lots of copies of that gene and then detect um, at some level, we've created enough of those copies to create a detection or a signal, and then we use that to um, tell us how many strands were in our original sample. So that's the basis of the molecular methods that we, the qPCR methods that we use when we don't have 
uh, culture methods available. And there's some issues with molecular methods. They're, I mean, they've revolutionized detection as well as other fields, but um, there's still some problems. First of all, it looks like I cut off for a second. Can you hear me right now? Yeah, we can hear you now. OK, all right. I think I cut out. Um, so some, some issues with qPCR and RT-qPCR include that we have to design those primers, right? We have to get the right sequence for the virus that we're interested in. Um, and that's, that's an, designing those primers is, are, is an art. And there are a lot of um, primers that are out there in the literature that may not be doing what we think they're doing or detecting all of the norovirus, say, or the adenovirus that we want. And so um, this, result, this can result in a lot of false positives if maybe we're detecting something that isn't truly norovirus or adenovirus. Um, but likewise, if the virus has mutated and there's a new strain that those primers no longer can, can detect, we might also get false um, negatives and the virus could be there. It's just a strain that those primers have not been designed for. I find absolute quantification with molecular methods difficult. I mean, even though it is a quantitative method, we're really reliant on the, the standards that we use for qPCR. And if we want to use absolute abundances of, of these organisms to tell us something about the associated risks of, say, a drinking water or um, recreational water, we're really relying on the standards that those, the, the numbers that we get in the end are the true numbers that are in a sample. And I think there's, there's issues with this. Um, depending on people use lots of different kinds of standards, they make their standards in different ways, and we can get very different absolute values based on um, how we choose to make our standard curves. Um, another issue is that since we're only measuring uh, a piece of the nucleic acid, this, this technique doesn't really tell you whether or not you've got an infective organism. And in the end, an infective organism in terms of drinking water safety and, and recreational waters or food or how, whatever we're measuring viruses for. We, we want to know if the organism is creating a risk. And leftover nucleic material or nucleic acid material isn't, isn't a risk. Um, and then some of the work that my group has done is to try to understand, we, we often use molecular methods when we don't have culture methods. We'll use molecular methods before and after a, a treatment, a, a water quality treatment, to tell us something about where the organism is going. Um, but since it doesn't tell you anything about the infectivity, we've, we've tried to create methods that do get at infectivity a little bit better. One of the problems is that we're relying on an enzyme to read over our genome. And we don't know so well about what modifications in a genome that enzyme can or cannot detect. Um, and so when we, were, when we rely on these enzymes and we try to move towards using these enzymatic methods to tell us about the infectivity of an organism, uh, I think we've, we've shown some results that, that, that it's, these enzymes are often not good at detecting modifications in a genome. And so we still, using them um, for infectivity is, is, is quite problematic. All right. All right, so uh, I wanted to mention digital droplet PCR. Maybe some of you are, are using that. Uh, it's, it's a newer way of quantifying um, uh, a, a quantification method that targets the genes. Um, and I think this is, I, th I think it's a real promising method uh, for environmental monitoring because it gets at this uh, calibration curve issue where we, again, are so reliant on what we're using as our standards for traditional qPCR. This digital droplet PCR doesn't rely on standards. Instead, it um, really, it's an endpoint method where there's lots of different tiny little PCR reactions that take place in your analysis. And they're either at the end of amplification, they're either positive or they're negative. And there's so many of them that um, we can do statistics on the positives and the negatives and get at an uh, uh, absolute number that's not reliant on a standard curve. And so I think um, more and more labs are adopting this. And I think there's more, there's more studies coming out showing that um, for absolute quantification where you don't rely on a, on a standard curve, um, digital droplet PCR is pretty exciting. Um, 
of course, it still has, we still can't get at the infectivity. We still don't know if the organism is, is, a, is uh, infective. Notice I don't use alive for viruses because um, we don't really use live and dead for viruses, but whether it's infective, we, we still can't get at with digital PCR. All right, the last thing in terms of just kind of an overview of detection and issues, um, the, even if we have this great method that can detect viruses in water, a specific virus, virus in water, we're never going to overcome this issue of concentration. You know, it only takes one or just a few infective viruses to make somebody sick. And so when we do risk assessments and we try to get the risk of virus infection down to less than one in 10,000, the concentrations that we have to achieve the, 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 with water treatment are so low. So this is the concentration here to, to reduce the risk of um, the risk to one in 10,000. We have to have less than two times 10 to the minus seven viruses per liter. Um, to reach that level of, of um, risk. And so if you think about that practically, I've got a picture of Ann Arbor here on the left and a picture of the one of the water um, storage tanks we have in Ann Arbor here. We have to be able to, what that means is we have to be able to detect less than 12 viruses. So let's say if we're talking specifically about human norovirus, fewer than 10 human noroviruses in all of the water get, get sent out to Ann Arbor in a single day or less than one virus in this one tank of, of, of water. And so even if you've got a method that say you've got a, a milliliter of water and you can detect down to one virus in that milliliter of water, that doesn't get at this issue of this vast volume of water that we need to be able to detect a single virus in to prove that it's, it's safe in terms of just viruses. And so I think no matter what detection method we get to, this is always gonna be there. And so, in reality, monitoring finished drinking water for all of the viruses that we care about just doesn't make, doesn't make sense at this time because of this concentration issue. There are places where detecting viruses is important, but perhaps not in finished drinking water on a regular basis. All right, so a little bit of what my group does in this space. We're, so this is this urban water cycle where viruses enter the sewage from humans and then um, you know, they can they go to the wastewater treatment plant in our wastewater. Sometimes they bypass the wastewater treatment plant in an in a overflow event. But even within the wastewater treatment plant, some vi there's quite a few studies that show that viruses do make it through. Um, they, they're reduced. The, the number of infected viruses are reduced, but they, they can often um, exit in the effluent in an infective state. And then, of course, that water is picked up downstream as a drinking water source. So we look at, we, we often try, because, because detection is so difficult, it's very useful to know something about the mechanistic fate of viruses through these different treatment processes at the wastewater treatment plant and the drinking water treatment plant so that we can predict using virus characteristics how it might behave in different, different treatment processes. And it also having a mechanistic understanding of viruses helps us better understand how to, how to detect them. And so my group uses a lot of surrogate viruses. We do work with some human pathogens, but mostly we work with phage. And the truth is that a bacteriophage and a human virus are very similar in structure. In structure. They have the same kind of geno genomic material. They're, you know, they're single-strand RNA or single-strand single DNA or double-strand nucleic acids. They're made out of the same basic building blocks. The protein sequences are different, but the protein building blocks are the same. And same thing with these envelopes. Of course, one gets its envelope from a prokaryote, a bacterial cell. Bacteriophages get their um, lipid layer from a bacterial cell, where human viruses get their lipid bilayer from a human cell. But besides that, they, they're really similar. And so my, I've always argued that, you know, the more we know about phage fate, phage are much easier to work with. We can get them to higher concentrations. They're easier to detect. And so the more we can characterize how different characteristics of phage impact their fate and their ability to be detected, the better we can extrapolate to that to human viruses, which are much more difficult to work with and, and to quantify. And so the first little project I want to get into a bit more detail on is about envelope viruses. Uh, I mentioned that historically, the environmental field is focused more on non-envelope viruses, and there's a reason for that. Most enteric viruses are non-enveloped, um, uh, whereas respiratory, a lot of respiratory viruses and, and viruses involved with direct contact are often envelope viruses. Um, 
But there are cases where envelope viruses go out into the environment and can be picked back up from the environment and can be excreted in our waste um, and so make it to the wastewater treatment plant. But there really wasn't a lot of data when I wrote this proposal several years ago on how that envelope impacts its environmental fate. These are a couple of uh, you know, high visibility outbreaks we've had over the last five years um, that involved envelope viruses. Ebola was another one, um, which was uh, really big at the time when this project started. And so I had, in a, and during my postdoc, I had done this study where we looked at, this is a bacteriophage MS2 is kind of the lab rat of viruses. Um, it's, a, it's a phage that infects E. coli and you can grow it to really high concentrations. It's a single strand RNA uh, virus. And so we had done a study during my postdoc on describing how it breaks down during disinfection, trying to get at the mechanisms of how uh, a virus is inactivated and we use lots of different disinfectants and showed which ones were attacking its capsid, which ones were attacking its, its genome. And the idea is that if we have that kind of a mechanistic understanding, then when new viruses emerge, we might not be able to culture them, but we can predict based on, based on our mechanistic understanding how they'd behave in different disinfecting treatments. And so we took the same approach with an envelope virus. Um, we knew that envelope viruses generally, and this is just really general, there are exceptions to the rule, um, are more susceptible to oxidants than non-envelope viruses, but we really didn't know why. We didn't know if it was the lipid bilayer that was making it so susceptible. And so we took a, a model envelope virus and did the same kind of mechanistic study and, just, and compared it directly to this MS2 virus to see why, what, what it was about its structure that made it so susceptible to um, disinfection with oxidants. And so if we look at, I, I mentioned that it's that they're generally more susceptible. You can see that here for these two models. And I should say these are just single models. They don't represent all enveloped and non-enveloped viruses, but they're a starting point. We lost you again. We've exposed the virus to on the x-axis and the level of inactivation. So a one log inactivation of our virus would be a 90% inactivation. Um, two logs would be 99%. And so we can see here, if we look at this non-enveloped MS2 versus Phi6, the Phi6 um, is inactivated at um, much lower doses than the MS2. And if we take the first order um, regions of these curves and get a rate constant, we can see that even more obviously here, the rate constant on the y-axis versus the organism on the x, um, that how much more susceptible Phi6 is to um, chlorine disinfection than MS2. But we still don't know why that is. So we went and did some additional experiments. We took our envelope virus, just as we had done in the MS2 research, and exposed it. We looked here at both free chlorine and UV, two common disinfectant methods. We tracked the loss of its infectivity with plaque assays, those, um, cell, those um, cell culture assays that I showed you earlier. We looked at how its genome was reacting using um, molecular methods. So we looked at two different, three different regions of its genome, um, large regions of its genome, so with molecular methods, and then looked at how quickly its genome was reacting as it was being inactivated with either free chlorine or UV. We studied how its proteins were reacting through the same process, and we did this with mass spectrometry, protein mass spectrometry, where we would digest the proteins. We did a um, isotope labeling quantification, so we had a, 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 a nitrogen-15 labeled virus that we used as an internal standard, and then what we could do is quantify all of the different peptides in the proteins and how each of the peptides, each of the peptides in the proteins, how quickly they degraded as the virus was being treated with chlorine. And then last, we used lipid, lipid mass spectrometry um, to do the same thing, quantify how quickly the lipids in this envelope were reacting as, it, as the virus was being inactivated with free chlorine and UV. And we did this in an effort to identify kind of the weakest link in the virus. Was it genome mediated? This was, it, was the genome reacting the fastest? Were different, were specific regions of the proteins reacting the fastest, or was the, were the lipids reacting the fastest? And then we would compare those rates um, with the rates that we observed in this other non envelope virus to see how they might differ. And so this is some of the data summarized for the, for the genome. So if we looked at how quickly the genome regions were degrading in MS2, in fact, this is the extrapolated 
rate constant, so it should be encompassing um, all, of the, all of the genome, how quickly it's reacting. We see that the Phi6 genome um, is reacting faster than the MS2 genome. But in fact, if we compare it, um, if we compare it to the rate of inactivation, so if we look at the rate of genome reaction and compare that rate constant on the y-axis to the rate of inactivation, which I had shown earlier, we'll see that the MS2 genome is reacting at about the same rate that we're observing virus inactivation, whereas the, the envelope virus, Phi6, is not that the genome is reacting slower than it's being inactivated. And so this suggests that the genome is not driving, reactions in the genome aren't driving inactivation of the envelope virus, but they were for our non-envelope virus. We did the same thing with the proteins. So what I'm showing here are different proteins, either the, these were the fastest reacting protein, or sorry, peptides. So these are pieces of the proteins in the capsid. And we looked at all the different pieces of the proteins um, in the capsids, and we looked at the fastest reacting pro uh, peptides. One thing we noticed right off the bat is that the peptides in this non-envelope virus were reacting much slower than the peptides in the envelope virus, um, orders of magnitude slower. And so if we, if we actually sum, if we can summarize all of the different peptides here on the left for the enveloped virus versus all the peptides on the right for the non-enveloped virus, we see about 150x difference in the most reactive peptide in Phi6 and the most reactive peptide in MS2. So it seems like this MS2 is just really robust against this oxidant-free chlorine, the proteins in this, in this MS2. They're somehow protected from reactions with um, free chlorine, where the peptide, where the proteins in our Phi6 are, are much more susceptible to attacked by, by the chlorine. And if you look specifically at what these sequences, so we have not only where the peptides are at, but also their sequences, we noticed that um, all of these really reactive peptides in Phi6 have methionine residues. And if you, you can, based on crystal structures of these organisms, you can see where these um, peptides are and these, and specifically the methionine amino acids, where they're located on the capsid. And we saw that Phi6 just has a lot of methionine residues that are exposed to the outside surface of the, of the capsid. And so this suggested that, um, that maybe one of the things that makes these viruses like Phi6 more susceptible is the exposure of methionine, um, methionines in the, in the proteins. One other thing we noticed is we expected that just the methionines exposed on the outer capsid would be the most reactive, when in fact there's three layers of, or, or there's three layers of proteins. There's the proteins in the lipid layer out on the very outside. There's a there's a outer capsid, this light, this this gray colored capsid, and then there's a, a black um, a black inner capsid there. And we found that the the methionines reacted fastest on the outside of all of these different proteins, whether it was on the inner capsid, the outer capsid, or in the envelope. And so we had thought that the, 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 virus, the proteins out in the envelope would react the fastest, when in fact the methionine residues exposed to the solvent, even in the inner capsid, were also reacting as fast. And so that told us that chlorine was able to penetrate this um, lipid bilayer and make it into the inside of the capsid where the, the, the genome is located. And then the last thing um, on this part is we, we didn't see anything, any, we didn't see much de degradation in the lipids. These are some of the lipid um, molecules that are in the lipid bilayer. And over this, so what I'm showing here, the x-axis is the level of inactivation. So we're taking this, vi we're really killing this virus. We've degrade, you know, this is a nine log inactivation. So 99.9999999% of this virus has been inactivated. And at that level, we really haven't seen a huge drop in the, the concentration of our intact lipid molecules. So we, this wasn't a surprise to us. If you look at the rate constants for these lipid molecules, they're much lower than protein and nucleic acid components of a virus. But our, our data confirmed that the lipids themselves were not that reactive with the chlorine. It was the proteins that seemed to be the most reactive. Um, we, in addition to looking at how the envelope viruses react with chlorine versus the non-envelope viruses, we did some work on their fate in wastewater. We expected that envelope viruses probably partition to a greater extent with solids in wastewater than the non-envelope viruses. So what we did is we took four models. These are two model envelope viruses 
two model non-envelope viruses and we added them to untreated wastewater. And then we studied their survival, just how quickly they're inactivated in wastewater, how much they sorb to the solids in wastewater, and um, whether we could recover them with common methods. I am going to, I want to go through this um, a little bit faster because I want to get to the detection method part of my talk. But the take home here is with the, that our two model envelope viruses did, they were inactivated at a faster rate in, in wastewater. And that was enhanced at higher temperature wastewater. So we looked at two different temperatures of untreated wastewater to kind of encompass what we would see in, in, in real sewage systems. And um, uh, we did see faster inactivation of the envelope viruses, but not so fast that if we had envelope virus go into the sewer, they wouldn't you know, be of concern, especially at the lower temperatures. We think that sewage water spends you know, at most 24 hours in a sewage system before it reaches a wastewater treatment plant, we'd see that less than 90% of the viruses had been inactivated at 10 degrees. This was important because right around the time we were doing this research, we had this, this Ebola scare um, with the uh, Ebola outbreak that was happening um, in Africa. And people were wondering, we had a couple of cases in the United States, people that were brought back to be treated at facilities in the US. And we had you know, concern about what does that mean for wastewater? If we're not doing anything to treat the wastewater at the hospitals and it goes into the sewage system, if we have a major outbreak, do we need to worry about this at a wastewater treatment plant? And I think um, you know, it, would, it gets diluted a lot in wastewater, but in terms of, I think the assumption had been before, Ebola is an envelope virus. It dies off really fast in wastewater, where there really hadn't been studies to show that before. And I think that our results show that they're gonna inactivate faster than non-envelope viruses in general, but I don't think we can assume that they're automatic, you know, that they're instantaneously inactivated when they go into the sewer systems. Um, some additional research showed that they do tend to, the envelope viruses do tend to absorb to a greater extent to solids than the non-envelope viruses, but still at the most we saw 40% absorbed to solids in a wastewater when we spiked them into wastewater. And so um, even though more will partition out into the solids at a wastewater treatment plant, we still keep quite a bit in the, in the, the water. All right, so some conclusions from this envelope virus work. Um, we did see that our model envelope virus was more susceptible to chlorine than the model non-envelope virus. And we think that was because um, there were proteins in our envelope virus model that were really susceptible to chlorine. Um, and so it was a protein mediated inactivation with chlorine where MS2 um, was this, this non-envelope virus was inactivated based on its genome. Now this is just one model envelope and one model non-envelope, but what we hope to do is kind of expand the suite of viruses that we have this mechanistic understanding of. And so therefore when we have a virus, we can't culture and we wanna know where do we think it's gonna fall in terms of susceptibility to chlorine or to ozone or to UV, we'll be able to say, well, because of these um, structural characteristics of the virus, we think it's going to be very susceptible to chlorine, or we think it's not going to be, it's going to persist in chlorine longer than other viruses. So that's what we're trying to get towards. Um, we were surprised to see that free chlorine penetrated the lipid bilayer to react with um, methionines that were exposed to solvent, but were, that were located on the inner capsid of, of the virus. Um, and then we saw that these envelope models uh, did uh, partition greater to wastewater solids, but that they would they could remain infective um, within the time frame that wastewater travels through our sewage systems. Okay, and then I want to wrap up my presentation with kind of a pushing method. We're trying to to expand our options for how we monitor for viruses. So right now I reviewed culture-based methods. The nice thing about culture-based methods is that they do get at infectivity. If you have a cell line that you can that's complementary to your virus you're looking for, you can get it whether the virus is infective. The problem is, I didn't mention this before, when you grow a cell line and then you infect it with your wastewater or your drinking water and you see an effect in your cells, it's difficult to know what virus infected your cells. It's not a matter of only one type of virus infects this type of cells. You can have lots of viruses that infect a specific kind of culture cell or tissue system. And so, um, its specificity is difficult just based on culture methods. Um, you can measure lots of viruses at once, but then you really can't tell, often you can't tell which is which based on these cytopathic effects or the things that are happening to your cells. Um, and it, it's a lot of work to do these culture-based methods. You have to have um, 
uh, growing tissue cultures is not easy. It takes a lot of time. It takes uh, a lot of money. And so it's not something feasible for your typical water utility to do. Um, but then when we look at the alternative, I think more utilities are starting to, uh, uh, to invest in PCR or molecular methods to do on site. The issue with that is, yeah, you might get a signal that you might learn that there was a virus there at some point, but you won't know if it's infective. And so deciding when it's dangerous is, is nearly impossible with qPCR and detecting viruses. Um, you can be very specific if you design your primers correctly. Um, you, in a single PCR reaction, it's difficult to detect more than one virus at a time because you've designed those primers for a specific virus or a specific group of virus. So it's hard to make this, there, there are ways to make it multiplex, but it takes a lot of time and, and method development to do that. Um, and it, the method optimization is high. Every time you add a new virus to your PCR analysis, you have to go back and optimize for that reaction. And then if viruses do mutate very quickly, and so there's always this concern that your primer was developed, the viruses have mutated, and now it might not be um, detecting your virus of interest. And so people have, people have moved this forward and mix these two methods. So you can imagine that if you culture a virus and then you use PCR to measure which virus you've cultured, you can get at some of these issues. You're still getting at infectivity. Now you can be specific because you know that you've detected the virus that your PCR method detects. Um, you're still, you still have the issue of primer design and um, method optimization here. And so with this in mind, we proposed a new method for um, for monitoring viruses, specifically in, in water samples. So the idea is it's like this integrated PCR system, but instead of doing PCR detection at the end, we're using mass spectrometry. So the idea is if we have this wastewater, we add it to a cell culture system that we know can um, replicate human cell or human viruses. And so we've added the virus to this these, the cell culture system and we let it incubate. We don't need to let it, we theoretically shouldn't need to let it incubate as long as we would to form plaques. Really, we just want to detect some kind of amplification happening here from these, these infections. And so if we take off um, the, the, the lysate that comes off of these cells and we digest them with proteases, that means we're going to chop up all of the proteins that were in these viruses and anything else that was in the water. We chop them all up and then we run them with LCMS. We can get the masses of all of these different peptides from the viruses and everything else that was in the sample. Um, and we can fragment them and get the sequences in addition to their masses. And then what we do is we bounce it across a database of all of the recorded um, viral proteins. And so the idea is that we're going to detect the proteins rather than the molecular, you know, the, the genome sequences. And this, in this system, we don't need to design primers. We'll, we should be able to detect anything that's growing in these cells. Um, and it doesn't require as much, it therefore doesn't require as much method optimization and you can monitor for lots more viruses at once. And so my student Yin Yi, she, she optimized this method using a, a model system. We had, this is a coronavirus, same type of virus as SARS or MERS, but this is one that infects um, mice. And so we had a mouse coronavirus. We had the um, complementary cell lines. So these are mouse cells where we would add the virus to the cells, let it incubate, and over time take off samples and see how long it would take to, um, to replicate and get it to detect with the, the LCMS method. Um, once we got that to work, that worked great, but that was, of course, a clean sample, and we were just really measuring the replication of these viruses in their host cells. We wanted to move to wastewater, so we optimized the method by spiking these, these, these coronaviruses into wastewater and then adding the wastewater to the cells, letting it wait some amount of time and then detecting them with the LCMS method. We wanted to figure out how long we needed to let them incubate before their signals were detectable with the mass spec method. We wanted to figure out the minimum number of viruses that we could detect in that original wastewater sample. We wanted to make sure that the wastewater wasn't having a, a bad effect on these cells or impacting our ability to detect that the virus is replicating in them in the end. And so once we, op we did optimize this, we found that we could detect, you know, down to just a couple of different viruses if we let it go long enough because they were just being amplified in the cell systems. Um, and so then we went to a real wastewater treatment plant and used our method on a real wastewater treatment plant. So we took untreated wastewater um, and we took treated wastewater as well. This is the different points in the um, local wastewater treatment plant that we measured this, that we did our detection at. So 
In most detection methods, you do have to concentrate your water and enrich it for viruses. So we, we did do some virus enrichment. We ended up with a 50x concentration of wastewater at each of these different steps. And we added that to human cell lines. So we've tested three different cell lines at this point that are known to replicate human, human viruses. And we let that incubate for up to 14 days and took samples throughout that time and then analyzed it with our LCMS method. And I'm just going to show you some of our preliminary results. This was really cool because we didn't detect any cytopathic effect in our cells. We, we saw something that looked a little funny in them, but we weren't seeing any plaques form. We wouldn't have called these positive for human viruses um, based on the traditional methods. But we did see a lot of rheoviruses, and these are kind of a emerging virus that we're just starting to learn, uh, learn about. Um, I think there was a recent science paper that in implicated them in celiac disease. I want to think that's the disease that they were implicated with. But uh, the main thing is we detected them in both two different primary influence that we detected from different days. We detected different strains at the same time. This would be difficult to do with um, with a uh, qPCR-based method unless we had designed primer specific for these different strains. Um, and I should, you might, you might be thinking, well, what's the advantage of this over shotgun sequencing? And I think one of the main advantages here is it's much easier to do, but also we can measure for all different genome types at the same time. These real viruses are double-strand RNA viruses. That's not something that we would typically sequence for um, with metagenomics. And so we could detect RNA viruses or DNA viruses in the same assay because we're detecting the proteins and not the nucleic acids. So we detected all of these viruses in our influence. And then interestingly, we saw, as, ex as we would expect, we, we detected fewer, um, fewer of the proteins, I should say. We detected fewer of the proteins in the effluent pre-UV treatment, and we didn't detect anything in the effluent um, after UV treatment. And so as expected, we're removing the viruses and actually inactivating them as we go. I, I guess I should mention what the sequence coverage means. This means that for this particular virus here at the top, this real virus type one, we had protein, a 32% protein cap uh, coverage of its capsid protein. And so my student decided that the capsid protein, it's the most prevalent in the virus particle. And so she used that um, to see how much coverage we had. And the higher the coverage means both the more abundant that, that virus is and al the also the most, more confident you are um, that you've detected that virus. And so this is new. We're submitting this paper soon, but we're excited by it. We think what we could do is, you know, have lots of different tissue cultures growing at the same time. And in fact, our, our water, whatever water we're interested in understanding what infective human viruses are there, add them to many different cell lines that that replicate different types of human viruses. And then um, we could even combine these and measure them together in a single LCMS run and, and see what total viruses we had in our sample. And so I guess some of the things that this addresses, it, it gets its specificity without having to design probes that are specific. As long as our databases are, um, are complete, and that's a whole different issue, but um, we are, we've got pretty good protein databases for viruses, then we don't have to design anything that's specific. We just bounce our results against the databases. Um, it can detect multiple viruses. I should mention that it's probably going to detect the viruses that are replicating the fastest. So if you have real virus that infects your cells really fast and makes lots of copies versus, say, an ecovirus that infects your cells slower, you're going to get a bias towards the viruses that are infecting your cells the quickest. But I guess that's true with any culture-based method. And it really didn't require much method optimization once you know how to culture your cells and, and run the LCMS method. Okay, with that, I want to leave a, at least a few minutes for discussion or questions that you have. So I'll end again on my acknowledgments um, page, and I'm I look forward to hearing from you. Great, thank you. Uh, before we take questions from the room, I'll remind our online audience that you can type in your questions in the question chat box at any time, and we'll answer those shortly. So do we have any questions from our audience here? Yep. That's great talk. Uh, I have a question, you know, um, right now, you know, a lot of research working on the uh, develop some uh, biosensor to analyze uh, some bacteria, like E. coli. I just wondering, do you think you have some biosensor technique, you know, to, you know, to analyze their, 
the virus, you know, especially yeah. for the, uh, you know, everyone, you know, like you're talking about your everyone's the virus. Right. Um, so I think, yes, you can develop biosensors for viruses and you could use it based on, you know, recognition of, of specific protein motifs on the outside of its capsid, um, or you could use specific probes for its genome. I guess the issue with these biosensors when you're looking at water comes back to that concentration issue. So with a biosensor, um, you can only monitor so much volume at a time, right? And so, and there might be work being done on this to, to kind of, um, to make higher throughput sensors. But if you're relying on the signal from, if you say you have an antibody sensor that's, or um, aptamer sensor, where you've, you're, you've got something that's designed to detect a specific virus, you've got to get that virus in, in, um, in contact with whatever it is that's sensing it. And so with these dilute solutions, even in wastewater, the solutions are still fairly dilute. And if you've got a single virus, in you know, 100 milliliters, um, getting that virus to the to the sensor output is it's that's the difficult part. Like I said, that's my my take on it. But yes, you should be able to develop sensors for viruses, just just like for bacteria. Uh, any other questions from our room here? Okay, not at this time, and I don't see any questions online right now. Chris, is it okay if our audience members contact you later if they have any questions? Absolutely, yes. And if I haven't shared my email address with you, I can I can do that. Yeah, um, can you put it up on the screen or? Sure, let's see how I could do that. Um, Let's see, let, well, I'll test my technological skills here. Um, nope. <laughs> I think I'm going to have to end the show. Let's see okay. if I can. That's okay. Otherwise, um, yeah, if you'd like to spell it or um, people can email me. I'll and, do it. Um, I'll send it on. I think I can do it. I think I got it. Can you see my screen right now? Yeah. All right. There we go. There is my email address. <laughs> See if it comes back. There okay. we go. Hey, we get you, Michelle. Edu. <laughs> okay, great. Um, oh, and we do have a question from our audience. Okay, great. So, um, when you're culturing the different viruses, how do you know if there's? Oh, what do you put in your? Uh, plate specifically how do you know that there aren't a couple viruses in there attack you know attacking those cells at the same time right right okay so say you've got two different types of viruses that can both infect the cells at the same time so one of the way in in like classical culturing um people people have recognized that you know the effects that certain viruses have on the cells so some cell, some types of viruses might form these plaques that i showed you these holes in the in the in the cell layer and maybe people will assume well if it's a plaque then we know it's virus a because we know virus b and c don't create plaques in these types of cells or maybe the cells kind of change shape into some funky funky um, you know morphology if they're infected by virus B. And so based on how they affect the cells and the appearance of the cells, people have kind of deduced what kind of virus was infecting them. But that gets to, you know, that that helps at some level. But if we're interested in a virus strain or if we have some new type of virus, we can't tell just based on the cell culture method um, that you have more than one virus there. We know we have some kind of infective virus there, but we don't know the type. And so that's where the this so when you now you can do PCR after you if you've got your water and you put it into the cell system now you can do PCR which goes in and identifies the genes that are the viral genes specifically that are there and so that's this integrated cell culture PCR where, where they'll identify the genes of a virus that's replicating in a cell and then they can say oh it was polio one that was replicating in these cells because we detected it with qPCR but the problem is again that you can't 
sometimes you, you have to design the right QPC or the right PCR assay to go look for the right virus in order to capture it. And so with this mass spec method, if you if we go back to that table, we can see that there were in this one, you know, in this one cell ex set of cells, we had many strains of reovirus infecting these cells at the same time. And the reason we can tell that is that reovirus type one and reovirus type three their proteins are slightly different. They've mutated, you know, there, there's, there's mutations between or sequence differences in the proteins. And we're detecting those sequence differences with the mass spec. And so we can see that this, you know, one peptide that we detected, we know that's a specific peptide for real virus type three, where another peptide we detected with the mass spec, we know that that's a peptide specific to type one. And so this is, an, you know, in addition to that PCR based approach to differentiating the viruses that are infecting the cells. This just allows you to be a bit broader and see everything that's there based on the protein sequence. Does that make sense? Uh, yes. I had another follow-up on that. Is this <clears throat> is this used or your new method could be used uh, for blood samples of, of for people to yes. detect if they have more than one or if you don't know what quite what's going on with them? Yes, and I should mention this, like so many of the methods that we use, <laughs> we've taken them from medicine. And so uh, when we started this project, no, I, I didn't see any papers where they've used this approach in medicine for viruses. They use the mass spec approach for bacteria where they'd culture bacteria on a plate and then they'd prick one of those colonies and they'd send it through this mass spec approach and they'd use it um, to detect what bacteria were in a human sample but I hadn't seen it used on viruses yet. But since we've started this project, we have seen one or two papers come out where they are using the same kind of approach on human samples. I can't remember if it was blood or urine or stool, but this, this approach has been used um, in, a, in a, at least in research so far. I don't know if it's being used um, widely in practice. Okay, uh, we do have another question here. Yeah, I have a question about, you know, uh, usually, you know, the, for the water, uh, you know, like a virus contain the water for irrigation. Um, if you, you know, the, as I know, the, for the passenger, you know, bacteria, they can uh, do some internalization, go into the, take by the, uh, uh, like a food plant, go into the plant, you know, go into plant or inoculate mm -hmm. in the plant. I just wondering for virus have a potential because they're small than, you know, size small than bacterial. Do you think the virus, you know, have a potential, you know, internalization, you know, can take up the by plant, you know, mm -hmm. then enter out the food food chain? Right. I think I've seen studies where they've shown with um, with lettuce that viruses can be taken up into the plant. I think it was hard to prove whether it was just sorbed really well to the outer surface of the lettuce or whether it had actually been internalized. But I do, I haven't researched this recently, but I remember when I was working on a USDA proposal several years ago, I did find some papers where they showed that um, viruses were being internalized into lettuce. But I, 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 that's about as much as I can, I can answer on that at this time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a follow up to that, would your method be able to tell if it was really inside the plant? cells or just on the surface of the lettuce? I don't think mine would because that's really about, you know, how you're going to, what you will, what you want to do is separate from, say, imagine you've got a leaf of, of lettuce and you want to know what's inside the plant versus what's sorbed to the outside of the plant. To do that, you've really got to pull all of the viruses that are sorbed off of the plant and make sure that you're really getting everything that's on the inside of the plant. So that's almost, that's more of a pre- you know, pre-sample treatment um, step. And then once you once you get what you think is internalized versus what's externalized, then yes, you could use this method to say we do or don't have viruses in our in our plant samples, but separating the two different um, the two groups of viruses that are on or in a plant would be a different, a whole different uh, technical challenge. Wonderful. We are coming up on our hour mark for the comp for the seminar. So I want to thank you again, Krista, and I am looking forward to meeting you at our conference in May. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>
Great. Have a good day, everybody.